Computer programs manage information, and in all likelihood, that's why you're developing an application in the first place. This information could be personal information, such as managing a soccer schedule, or it could be a simple program to balance your checkbook. The information you're managing could be quite complex and related to a business. Maybe you're writing an order entry system, or maybe you're writing a game, and the information you need to manage is where on the screen the users move the mouse. So you need to manage information and store information. One way to store information is in variables. Another way, of course, could be in a database. We're talking about variables here. So variables are one place that you'll store information. Variables are in memory, so they're not on the hard drive. Now you can, if you need to, copy the contents of a variable and write it to a file, and then later on you could read that file and put the information back into variables, but while your application's running, the variables exist only in memory. You can create variables at the start of your programs, or as needed later on. Variables have three components. The data type, which is the type of information you're storing. Is it a number, a string, a date? Variables need a name so that you and the compiler can distinguish one from another. And then variables have a value, which of course is the information stored in the variable. There are some rules for variable names. A variable name has to begin with an alphabetic character or an underscore, and then contain only alphabetic characters, numbers, and underscores. And if you begin with an underscore, there has to be at least one alphabetic character or number in there. And then your variable names have to be less than 1,023 characters, which should not be too imposing a limit on you. Your variable names should be descriptive, and they should be of reasonable length. So imagine you see code such as A equals B plus 7. This tells you nothing. Unless it's a very, very small program, you don't know what variable A represents, and you don't know what variable B represents. Although those names are of reasonable length, they're not very descriptive. And if you go back to the program three months later, you're not going to know what that line of code is doing. Consider another line of code that says, the salary that the employee gets after receiving a raise equals the salary that the employee is making now before the raise happens times 1.05. Well, those variable names are pretty descriptive, but they're awfully long. So maybe what you would do instead is have a line of code that reads new salary equals current salary times 1.05. And that tells you everything you need to know. You take the current salary, you multiply it by 1.05, which is a 5% raise, and you store that to a variable called new salary. So keep your variable names short, not too short, make them descriptive, and that way your code is easier to type and easier to read. To declare a variable, use the dim keyword. The runtime then creates storage space for that variable in memory. You then use the as clause to specify what data type you're using. Let's look at some examples. The first line of code, we create a variable called counter1 and declare that it will be an integer and hold numeric values. In the second line of code, we're creating counter2, declaring that that's an integer, and then initializing it to a value of 612. So counter1 does not have a value specifically assigned to it. It would then get the default value for integers, which is 0, and counter2 would be storing the value of 612. In the next line of code, we're declaring three string variables, message1, message2, and message3 all defined as string. Message1 is not assigned a value, so it gets the default value of an empty string. Message2 is explicitly assigned an empty string, and message3 is assigned the string hello. Variables have a lifetime and a scope. The lifetime of a variable represents the length of time that the variable is available to you to use in your code. If you declare a variable in a method, that variable will be in memory while the method is running. 
when the method's done running, the variable is no longer in memory. The scope of a variable determines what code can use it. So a variable declared in a method will be available only to that method. You can think of the variable as belonging to the method. It's not available to other methods. To have a variable be available to multiple methods, then you declare it at the class level. A variable declared at the class level is available to all of the methods in that class. Let's go see a demo of creating and using variables. I'm in the sample application, data types and variables. And what I'm going to do is run the application and walk through a number of examples. So let's take a minute to just do a quick tour of the Visual Studio environment. In the upper right is the Solution Explorer that has my project and my file, module1.vb, which contains all of my code. The bottom window is Properties, where I can set properties of any number of items, such as the project, or if I was doing a Windows application, I could set properties of forms. If I was doing a web application, I could set properties belonging to objects on a web page. We're using a console application here, so I don't really have much use to set properties. In the middle is the code editor. Here's where I write code. The bottom window is the output window, which will show me when I run the application whether or not it built. When the application first runs, the main method is run, and that will display the main menu. And then from the main menu, I can make choices to run any of the examples. I'm going to run this application. I can click on the green arrow. I can also press F5, and that will start the application. This brings up the console window in the main menu. I'm going to press A to look at the variable scope example. Now I've set breakpoints on all of the methods here, and that will temporarily pause execution of the program. And while I'm in debug mode, I can look at the values of variables, and I can also step through my code one or more lines of code at a time. In the variable scope method, we're using a variable called total amount. Now notice that variable was not declared inside the variable scope method. It was actually declared above in the code here. This is at the class level. So now total amount is available to any method in the class. I'll step over that line of code and move to the next line of code. Total amount is now assigned a value of 100. And then I'll step into the show total amount method, which then uses the write line method of the console class to write some text to the screen. So now I'll step over that and look at the console window, and it's written total amount is 100. Now watch what happens if I comment this out. I'll comment out that line of code. And now there's a blue squiggly line under total amount, and the compiler detects that the total amount variable is not declared, because by default, the total amount variable has a scope of the method that it's declared in. So if I don't declare the variable outside of the method, then the compiler is expecting that variable to be declared inside the method. And since it's not, I'll then get an error. In the code above, this method variable lifetime, I declare the variable inside the method, and therefore I can use it in the method. And once I uncomment this line of code and declare the variable at the class level, it then becomes available inside this method. So in this example, you've seen declaring a variable and assigning it a value. And then you've seen a little bit about variable lifetime and scope. Variables have three components. They have a name, they have values, and they have data types. In fact, all information has a type. And the type defines 
how the information will be stored, how you'll use the information, how you can manipulate information, and how you can display it. So depending on the type you declare a variable, that determines a lot of the ways on how you will use that variable. The .NET framework contains structures and classes that represent all of the various types of data, whether it's numeric data or string data or date or time data. It's all defined in the .NET framework. And then all of the data types in both Visual Basic and C Sharp are based on a .NET framework structure or class. And this winds up being one of the benefits of the .NET framework, is that data types are constant and the same across languages. In the old days, a data type in Visual Basic wasn't the same as a data type in C++, for example, and so it was hard to share data across multiple languages. In the .NET framework, that limitation goes away. A string in Visual Basic is the same as a string in C Sharp. Same thing with an integer or a decimal or any of the other data types. And that's because they're based on data types in the .NET framework, which underlies both Visual Basic and C Sharp. Let's look at integer data types. And there's a range of them. We'll start off with sbyte. And that's a VB keyword. And the sbyte data type in Visual Basic is based on the system.sbyte type in the .NET framework. And this is used to store a signed 8-bit integer between negative 128 and 127. And signed means that it includes both negative numbers and positive numbers. The byte data type is based on system.byte in the .NET framework. And this can be used to store an 8-bit integer between 0 and 255. Short is based on system.int16, so that's a 16-bit integer between negative 32,768 and 32,767. There's an unsigned version of this, which can store numbers between 0 and 65,535. Increasing in size, we have the integer data type, which is a 32-bit integer based on system in 32 and stores values between negative 2 billion and positive 2 billion. There's an unsigned version of this which stores values between 0 and 4 billion. Long is even larger and this is a 64-bit integer based on system.int64 in the .NET framework. As you can see, the range of values you can store in a long are extremely large. There's also an unsigned version of long called ulong. Again, that's a 64-bit number between 0 and an extremely large number. So how do you choose an integer data type? And as you saw, there's a lot of them. Well, the first thing you need to do is make sure that the data type you choose is appropriate for the data you're going to be storing. If you're storing numbers between 0 and 100, well, you certainly don't need to choose the long data type because there are smaller data types that will take up less memory that you can use. On the other hand, if you're storing numbers in the millions, then the short, which only goes up to 32,000, is not appropriate. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that you choose a data type that's appropriate for the data you're going to be storing just because you're storing numbers between 0 and 200 today, does that literally mean that you'll only ever store numbers at three digits? So you may want to use a data type that's a little bit larger, or maybe quite a bit larger, to give yourself room to grow. Then you want to balance memory requirement and performance. For example, the integer requires twice as much storage space than short does. But on the other hand, integer is more efficient because the .NET framework represents numbers as either 32-bit or 64-bit values. So the integer and the long are the more efficient data types, more efficient than byte or short. So you may be better off using integers rather than shorts based on performance. So the recommendation is that in general you should use integer unless you have concerns about memory usage. 
So if you're storing 10 numbers, 100 numbers, 1,000 numbers, use integer. On the other hand, if you're doing complex calculations with up to millions of numbers, then you might wind up using short because saving two bytes over millions of numbers adds up. Data types are based on structures in the .NET framework, and a structure is a type of class. And because the data types are based on structures, they have fields and methods that you can use in your code. For example, data types will provide a min value and max value field, and that represents the low end and the high end of the range of values. So you could use min value and max value to determine the smallest and largest integer that could be stored in a particular integer data type. In addition, you can use the toString method, which will return a string representation of a value. And you can then specify how you want the string to be displayed. So for example, you could specify that you want an integer displayed with commas separating the thousands. Now this isn't limited to integer data types. In fact, most of the data types that you'll be using have min value, max value, and toString. Integer data types store whole numbers, so there's no decimal point. If you need decimals, then you'll use floating point data types, and there are two of them. The smaller is single, based on system.single. That's a 32-bit single precision floating point number, and you can see the range of values here. So even though this is the smaller of the floating point data types, it still holds pretty large numbers. Even bigger is the double, based on system.double, which is a 64-bit double precision floating point number, and that holds even larger numbers than the single. In general, you should use double unless you have valid concerns about memory usage, because it does take up twice as much space. It's also more accurate, so if you're doing complex calculations, that's another good reason to use double. The decimal data type is based on system.decimal in the .NET framework. And it holds a 128-bit number, and you can see the range of values that it holds. So it holds smaller numbers than the floating point, system.single and system.double, but it holds them with greater precision. So you'd use the decimal data type if you're working with money. If you're doing financial calculations and you want the utmost in precision, you'll use the decimal data type. You saw earlier that all data types provide the min value, max value, and two string fields and methods. The decimal data type has some additional ones. Truncate will return the integer part and discard the fractions. Round rounds to the nearest integer, or you can also specify the number of decimal places to round to. Floor rounds to an integer smaller than or equal to the current value, and ceiling rounds to an integer greater than or equal to the current value. And let's go take a look at working with floating point and decimal data types. I'm running the sample application, and let's go take a look at some of the fields and methods of data types. So I'll press B and we'll look at the min max values method. And this method uses min value and max value to display the range of values that you can store in each data type. So if I want to see what the min value is for the byte data type, I can say byte.min value as well as byte.max value. And this method calls min value and max value on all of the data types. So here's short, here's integer, long, as well as the floating points, as well as the floating point data types, double, decimal, and also date time. So I'll run this, and the console window now displays for each of the data types the smallest and largest number that that data type can hold. So you could use min value and max value to test whether a variable is inside or outside of a particular range. Let's look at converting to strings using the toString method. I'll press C, 
and we're in the formatting with string method, we're going to create a variable, total amount, as integer, and set it equal to 1,000. And then call the toString method to display that variable as a string. So I'll step over this first line of code, and it displays the string representation of 1,000, which is 1,000. Not too interesting there. But I can also pass to toString various formatting symbols. If I pass a G, that says display this in the general format. D for decimal, N for number, C for currency, and X for hexadecimal. So let's run these. And now we can see that 1,000 displayed in the general format is 1,000, and displayed in the decimal format is 1,000 as well, because there are no decimals in this integer. But if I use the number format, then commas separate the thousands, and I get two decimal places. And this is because that's the way this computer is set up to display numbers. If the computer was set up to use periods to separate thousands and commas to show decimals, then of course the number format would display that way. Currency format adds a dollar sign in front of the number and then displays with commas and two decimal places. And a thousand displayed in hexadecimal format is 3E8. Continue on, let's look a little bit at the decimal data type. I'll press D for decimal literals. And in this code, I create a variable called total amount as a decimal. And then I set its value by saying total amount equals 45.61D. Now why do I need this D? I need this D to give the compiler some further instructions. I want to set the value of total amount to 45.61, but what is 45.61? Those are just characters that I typed into the code window. The compiler needs to translate that and then store that into a decimal. But 45.61, that could be a single, that could be a double, that could be a decimal. All three of those data types will store 45.61. So the compiler is going to choose one of those, and by default, it's going to choose double. Well, now I'm trying to store a double into a decimal, and the compiler is not going to do that. This code actually now won't compile, because you can't convert a double to a decimal implicitly, meaning you can't rely on the compiler to do this. And the reason is because a double holds larger values than a decimal. And if you convert a double to a decimal, there could be data loss. The compiler is not going to do a conversion that results in data loss. So I need to specify to the compiler that this 45.61 is a decimal, and one way I can do that is to use the D. That now says 45.61 as a decimal value stored into that decimal data type. Okay, let's move on, and let's look at some of the methods available to the decimal data type. I'll press E, and we're in this method here, decimal data type. I've declared a variable total amount, same as before, it's equal to 45.61. And then I declare two additional variables, total dollars and total cents, both as decimals. And the game we're playing here is dollars and cents. We go out to eat at a restaurant, the bill comes in, it's $45.61. One of us will pay the dollars, the other will pay the cents, so we need to do that calculation. Total amount is 45.61. If I use the truncate method of the decimal data type, that will return the dollar amount. Truncate will return the integer and throw out the decimal places. Total cents is then total amount of 4561 minus the result of that truncate, which is 45. Now we can see that the bill was 4561. You pay the 45, I'll pay the 61 cents. Now we'll set total amount to another 
decimal with more decimal places. And then we're going to round it. So total amount now is 45 dot. So you can see the value of total amount now with the number of decimal places. I call the round method that will round that number to 46. So by default, calling round rounds to zero decimal places. Optionally, I can pass the number of decimal places I want this rounded to. So when I say round total amount comma four, that rounds to four decimal places. Now let's set total amount to a negative number, negative 45.61. Then I'm going to create two additional decimal variables, total dollars one and total dollars two, and I'm going to use the floor and the ceiling methods. Total amount is negative 45.61, floor will round down. In other words, we'll round to the next integer closest to negative infinity. Ceiling will round up. So in this case, we'll round to the next integer closer to positive infinity. Display these. And the original value was negative 45.61. I round down using floor, and that returns negative 46. I round up using ceiling, that returns negative 45. You've seen in this demo using some of the fields and methods available to data types. All data types have a toString method and you can specify how you want a variable displayed. Then you saw some methods that were specific to the decimal data type. We've looked at numeric data types. Let's move on now and look at character and string and the other data types. The car data type is based on system.car and it represents characters. It literally holds a 16-bit numeric value between 0 and 65,535. And each one of those numbers represents a Unicode character. So the number is a code point and that code point represents a character. Now there's 65,000 plus characters. You're pretty familiar with the first 128 of these. That's the ASCII character set. So you can use the car data type to store individual characters. For example, a key that the user presses on the keyboard. The car data type has two methods. Convert from UTF-32 returns the character associated with the code point, and convert to UTF-32 returns the code point associated with a character. So you can convert from the numbers to the characters and back again. The card data type also has methods to determine the category that the character is in. For example, is it a control, a tab, carriage return, or line feed? Is it a digit, a letter, a letter or a digit? Is it lowercase? Is it a number? Is it punctuation? Is it a separator, such as a space? Is it a symbol, a plus sign, a minus sign, for example? Is it uppercase? Is it white space? You can use these methods to determine what type of character you're working with. The card data type holds a single character. The string data type, based on system.string, holds a series of characters, anywhere from zero characters to two billion characters. So you can store an awful lot of text in a string data type. If you want to include quotation marks in the string, use two of them in a row. So here, We've declared a variable called greeting as a string, and the string is going to be hello, quote, Robert, quote. So the two quotation marks before the word Robert places a quotation mark in the string. The first two quotation marks after Robert put another quotation mark in the string, and then the quotation before hello and the last quotation represent where the string starts and stops. The Boolean data type is based on system.boolean and it has two values, zero meaning true and one meaning false. So you can use the Boolean data type to test conditions, if something is true, if something is false. So for example, in this code, if the value of the first variable is greater than the value of the second variable, then we'll display the text 
that you see there using console.writeLine. First variable greater than second variable is an expression. And that expression will evaluate either true if the value is greater or false if it's not. The date data type is based on system.datetime. And it stores 64-bit values representing dates ranging from January 1st, 01, through December 31st, 9999, and times ranging from 12 a.m. to just before midnight. If you want to use a date data type in your code, you need to use the pound sign to delineate it. So this code here says create a variable called next century as a date data type equal to January 1st, the year 2100. If you didn't have the pound signs, then what you're basically saying is 1 divided by 1 divided by 2100, which is not a date. So using the pound signs tells the compiler that it's a date, month, day, year. And in fact, you have to use this format in Visual Basic. Even if your computer is set up to show the day first and then the month, in your code you have to use the month day format. Now be aware that the date data type is only in Visual Basic. It doesn't exist in C Sharp. C Sharp developers will use the date time data type from the .NET framework. So if you're going to be writing code in both Visual Basic and C Sharp, or if you're going to be writing code that developers more familiar with C Sharp will be looking at, you might consider just using the date time data type rather than the date data type. If you're moving code from Visual Basic 6 or you're going to be coding in only Visual Basic, then you can use either. The last data type we'll look at is object. The object data type is based on system.object. And in the .NET framework, everything ultimately derives from system.object. It's the highest level object there is in the entire .NET framework. The object can contain any data type, whether it's integers or decimals or floating point or text, doesn't matter. You can store anything you want in an object data type, including another object. The object data type provides the getType method to determine what type of data you're storing in there. And it's important to understand that, in fact, you don't actually store the value of the variable in an object data type. What you're storing is a pointer to the location in memory where the value is held. And this means when you use an object data type, there's some overhead involved because the runtime has to go look up the value in memory and bring it back down to the data type. If you change the data type, the runtime has to then go and write that into a different location in memory. So there is some overhead involved in using object data types. Let's go see a demo and see how to use this last group of data types. I have the sample application running and we're going to take a look at the car, string, boolean, date, and object data types. We'll look at car first. I'll press F. So in the first line of code, we're going to use the chr function in Visual Basic to return the character of code point 82. And then we'll use the asc function to return the number associated with the letter r. And you can see that code point 82 is an R, and R has a code point of 82. Now, CHR and ASC are specific functions in the Visual Basic language. Now, let's use the convert from UTF32 method and the convert to UTF32 method of the car data type to do the exact same thing. And you get the same results. So when would you use car or ASC as opposed to car.convert from UTF32 and car.convert to UTF32? Well, if you're writing Visual Basic only code, then it's fine to use CHR and ASC. It's less typing. If you're going to be converting this code to C Sharp or you're going to be coding in both, then you may want to stick to the .NET framework version and use the methods on the character data type. But you have your choice. Next, we'll create three character variables. The first is a letter, 
the second is a number, the third is a plus sign. And here I'm using the C to tell the compiler that these are literally character data types. Because if I don't include the C, if I get rid of that, then I'll get a compiler error because now I'm trying to convert a string to a character. So if I just type quote a quote, that's a literal. That a could be a character, it could be a string containing one letter. The compiler will choose one at compile time and by default it chooses string. So now a is a string that I'm trying to store in a character variable and the compiler complains. So I need to use the C to specify that this A literally is a character. Okay, define these three. And now I want to use the various is methods of the care data type to see what category these various characters are in. So car variable one is an A. Is that a control character? The answer should be no. That's false. Is it a digit? Should be false, and it is. Is it a letter? This should return true. It does. Next we'll test if capital A is in lowercase, and this should return false, and it does. Car variable 2 contains a 7. We can use the isNumber method to determine if 7 is a number. That should return true. Is it a separator? Is it punctuation? That should return false. And finally, we'll look at car variable 3, which is a plus sign. Is that a separator? The answer is no. Is it a symbol? That should be true. And finally, is it white space? That should say no. Okay, let's continue. And now we'll look at the string data type. I'll press G. And here I'm defining a variable called greeting as a string. And that string is hello Mike, and I want Mike to be in quotes. So I can just type two quotation marks before Mike and two after Mike. And the string is hello Mike in quotes. Let's look at the Boolean data type. I'll press H. I'll define two variables, first variable and second variable, both integers. And then if first variable, which is 7, is greater than second variable, which is 6, then I'll display that. This expression, first variable greater than second variable, should evaluate to true. Now I can test that. I'm going to highlight that, right click on it, and add a watch. And I can see that, in fact, it does evaluate to true, and therefore, will write the text. Next, let's look at the date data type. I'm going to declare a variable called next century as date equal 1 slash 1 slash 2100, January 1st, 2100. And I surround that with pound signs to indicate that this is a date. If I forget to do that, then I'm confusing the compiler because the compiler now thinks that what I really want to do is take 1 divided by 1 divided by 2100 and store that into a date variable. So to specify that this is a date, I put pound signs around it and get rid of the spaces. And now when I run this, I see that the first day of the next century is January 1st, 2100. And finally, we'll look at the object data type. 
I create a variable called anything as an object and I can literally store anything into that. I can assign it I can assign it a 7 which is an integer value and then I can display that anything of 7 and get type should return the type which as you just saw is an integer. I'll run that and 7 is of type system.int32. Get type returns the underlying .NET framework type, not the name of the data type in Visual Basic. I'm now going to store 65.76 to this. And now I've stored a double into that object. And finally, I'll store a string to it, the letter A, and that is a string. So I can store anything I want into objects which is handy, but it's also extremely inefficient. Because it's an object, the actual value is not stored in the variable. So when the runtime gets to this line of code, anything equals 7, it takes the value 7, writes it to memory, and then stores in the variable anything a pointer to where that 7 is stored. And then in the very next line, when we display the value of anything, the runtime gets the reference to that value, goes into memory to find the actual value, and then displays it. So in both of these lines of code, there's an extra step required, and that's inefficient. So objects are handy in that they can store anything, but they're very inefficient. So you've seen in this demo all of the data types in Visual Basic.